So today we have great speakers. We will have three speakers. Each of them will talk about a different component. Michal Schwartz will be talking about the neuroimmune access. Adam uh, Kappes will be then go deeper into the brain. And Carlos will connect everything to nutrition. As we all know, it's all there. So without further ado, I will move the screen to Michal Schwartz, from, who is a professor of neuroimmunology at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Michal, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Asya. I just want to clear, clarify to everyone that Asya was a PhD student in my laboratory. So we have connection beyond being a moderator of this session today. And for me, the brain-immune relationship or body-mind relationship is the immune system, how the immune system shapes the brain rather than how the brain shapes the immune system. And the topic of my lecture today is the brain immune ecosystem and the implication to dementia. So uh, over the last 24 years, and with all my, I, I should be very humble, but to say that this transformative view of brain immune relationship, for me, it's LC brain, it's LC immune system started in my laboratory 24 years ago. And now we would like, now that we understand, and when I'm saying we, it's my laboratory and now many other laboratories, including Asia and former graduate student from my laboratory, such as Jonathan Kipnis, together we created a better understanding of the brain immune relationship, which from my, from my point of view, created together an ecosystem which fulfill all the criteria of ecosystem, all the compartment, the brain, the immune cells within the brain niches, the communication, create together a physically connected unit. They are speaking to each other, controlling each other, and contributing to brain resilience and robustness. So the topic that I will cover in the next 14 minutes are the following, general introduction to brain immune relationship, implication to aging and transform the view of Alzheimer's disease, boost immunity. So we all know the cliche that it is a sound mind is sound means in, in a sound body. So the body mind relationship will exist from the, the end of the first century. I'm proposing that uh, what it means is mainly immune system, uh, LC brain requires LC immune system. So we know for decades that the role of the immune system is to recognize and destroy microorganisms, to recognize malignant cells before they turn into tumor and to eradicate them to help repair. It was believed for decades and it was received as axiomatic that the brain cannot tolerate any immune activity. It started with Paul Ehrlich in 1906 when he had coined the idea that the brain is compartmentalized from the rest of the body mm -hmm. and subsequently more established by Peter Medawa when he suggested the brain in his immune privileged site which was interpreted by the community as a site that cannot tolerate any immune activity and which was there for decades. Uh, in 1998 and 1999, my team was the first to suggest that macrophages and T-cell help brain repair. I cannot tell you, the audience all over the world, where are you? It was so difficult to convey the message because uh, at least with respect to macrophages, they are myeloid cells, and 10% of the cells in the brain are also myeloid cells, microglia. So the community at that time was not mature enough to understand that the brain, although their microglia needs extra immune cells, and these are macrophages. And now it's so easy to be, to be to accept the idea that there are microchannels that con are connecting the brain to the skull bone marrow. So there is a highway between the brain and the skull macrophages. Subsequently, we established the mechanism and the route of entry. But I think the, the major paradigm shift that changed the community thinking about the brain immune relationship came from this work when Yaniv Ziv and Jonathan Kipnis were a PhD student in my laboratory. And we show for the first time that brain function 
neurogenesis condition, and subsequently it was shown by Yoni and by others, other functions of the brain are dependent on T cell, whereas we know that T cells are not in the brain parenchyma. For example, we showed that if we age intentionally the immune system of young animal by transplanting bone marrow from skid mice, we got impaired cognitive ability. Altogether led us to suggest that an rich environment or whatever we are doing increase uh, brain function and neurogenesis are mediated at least in part by adaptive immunity. So the question was, where are these immune cells are located? So my team has showed that T cells are residing in the choroid plexus epithelium in the stroma between the epithelial layer and the blood vessels. We found that the majority of the cells there are, are memory T cells. And Jonathan Kipnis established that T cells are located in the meninges. Uh, there is, uh, of course, they are mediating distinct function, but both groups showed that niches within the brain uh, territory, but the uh, very uh, uh, restricted area are niches in which immune cells are residing, mainly uh, T cell. And now we know that many function, the diet, exercise, environmental factors, social behavior, many, many things are affecting immune fitness, which in turn affect brain fitness. And only now, uh, two months ago, one of the journalists of Nature, she wrote an article, which means 120 years since it was considered as isolated, a brain is isolated from the immune system, was an article uh, calling the immune cells as the guardian of the brain, which protect the brain, which 120 uh, years ago, no one would have considered. And of course, everything initiated 24 years ago when we were the first to dare to ask this question. So what is the impact in aging? So what we found that in aging, the, the aging of the choroid plexus epithelium, which is the uh, between interface between the brain and the circulation, in uh, aged differentially, and it's we found that it's affected by this function of the adaptive immunity outside the brain and by the function of the brain altogether leading to elevation of type 1 interferon. And by the way, it was found also in age population, not only in mice. And lately, the work of Tony Weiss Corey uh, demonstrated that a patient that died out of COVID-19 with impaired cognition show elevation of type 1 interferon in the choroid plexus. What is the role of type 1 interferon? And when you when you neutralize type 1 interferon in the choroid plexus, you can store, store, store cognition. But what is interesting that now we are saying that after so many years that we know that the immune system support lifelong LC brain plasticity, formation of new neuron, coping with stress, behavior repair, uh, what was shown by many other laboratories, and the aging of the immune system is aging of the brain. And what, uh, what the question is, what are the implications for uh, Alzheimer's disease? So as you probably know, the disease was dis uh, discovered many, many years ago. What we are now proposing, although there is not a single therapy that changed the course of the disease, that maybe what is needed is upstream to any dysfunction of the brain is to uh, activate the immune system. So basically what we suggested, based on deep understanding of the relationship between the brain and the immune system, and understanding the brain needs the immune system, however, in aging, the immune system is uh, deteriorating and major risk factor in it of Alzheimer's aging is to activate the immune system. So what we, we know about Alzheimer, that aging is indeed a major risk factor, that 90 to 95% of the cases are sporadic. The disease is very heterogeneous, it's dynamic and multi-stages. It, there is associated, of course, with protein opacity, which means misfolded mis protein, chronic local information, loss of synapses and cognitive loss. Only lately, at the end of 2001, it's the first time that there was an article following patients showing that uh, the A beta by itself, the opathy by itself, doesn't explain the reductive or co cognitive loss. On the y-axis, you see reduction of cognitive loss. And only in synergy with local inflammation, we see massive cognitive loss, which means that 
addressing A beta and tau are not sufficient to modify the disease. In 2018, four of us were asked what is the future in Alzheimer's? And you can see that still there are several groups that are insisting that A beta and we were the only ones suggesting to arm the immune system. And the, we got, it's still supported by the fact that, as I said, the aging of the immune system is aging associated with loss of interferon gamma, loss of the immune system activity. And this was supported lately by work of Tansy Ruders, in, in which he showed unexpectedly, according to his view, that there is a loss of interferon gamma in AD patients. So what we suggested based on this to reverse the, 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 uh, the cognitive loss or to arrest cognitive loss by restoring the function of the immune system. One way to restore the immune system is reduce immunosuppression. One of the mechanisms that suppress the immune system is immune checkpoint known in cancer, but it never been investigated in neurodegenerative diseases. So using anti-PD-1 or anti pd one I will not show you the data, uh, just briefly, that we saw that we can restore cognitive ability based on measurement in mouse model of amyloidosis in radial arm water maze. What you see on the right side, you see two-day maze. The black show you the number of errors that are uh, healthy animal are making, and you see that while the last trial there swimming directly to the platform. Red show you animals, Alzheimer animals never learning and remember. The gray show you the placebo and the green show you animal that receive a single injection of anti-PD-1 restore cognitive ability. So uh, we have we studied numerous mouse models. In all of them, we tested behavior, neuronal survival, disease pathology, synaps synaps uh, integrity, and brain inflammation. We tested it model of amyloidosis, model of theopathy. It is summarized here. It was repeated by several groups. The broken red line show you repetition by other group, basically to tell you that regardless of the primary cause of the disease, activating the immune system, reduce cognitive loss, reduce local inflammation, reduce pathology, and rescue neuron. So in a cartoon, I can show you how it works. We have, we have run out the mechanism, we established the mechanism, we see that the antibody activate the immune system outside the brain. As a result of, of it, we facilitate mobilization of um, macrophages and regulatory T cell. The macrophages locally, uh, we saw by single cell RNA sac that they are acquiring activity that microglia don't have. They are expressing scavenger receptor that can uh, uh, recognize this uh, damage associated molecular pattern and reduce proteinopathy. We see also that they are reduce the local inflammation altogether are leading to disease modification and this is single injection. So what's the difference between this approach and the other approach? It's upstream, it's activate the immune system, facilitate mobilization of immune cells. We still don't know whether they are coming from the skull bone marrow, which one identify lately, or from the blood or from any other place but monocytes derived macrophages can acquire activity that the microglia cannot do, and they can uh, uh, contain the multiple the, uh, key pathologies where the other cannot, uh, uh, where all other approaches tackling a single pathology. So my work over the last 24 years, since we initiated this paradigm shift of body-mind or immune system-mind, is heavily supported by DRC, which we received three times, and by other foundation, uh, Israeli foundation, uh, American foundation, and private foundation. These are key people in my laboratory, very international labo laboratory. All the single cells that I didn't have time to show, I did in collaboration with Ido Amit and Nomi Khabib in, now in a, a, a uh, Nibu University, and since it's a cover of 24 years of a paradigm shift, many of my former graduate students, including Asia, are contribute to this paradigm shift, and I will be able to take questions. I cannot attend the, the overall question session, so I would like to take such a question now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michal. 
It's been uh, very interesting. And I think we have, we already have some questions and obviously I, I have some. So first, uh, there is a question from the audience. Do can cancer patients that receive anti-PD-1 immunotherapy experience any, any changes in the cognitive improvement? And maybe if I expanded a little bit more, is there anti-morbidity between cancer and Alzheimer's, for example, that will kind of speak to Excellent that? Excellent question. So first, I didn't have time to elaborate. The mechanism of action is totally different from the mechanism of action in cancer. The different type of cells, in our case, it's CD4, in cancer, it's CD8. Because of the mechanism of action, the regimen that is required for uh, Alzheimer's is different from the regimen in cancer. And therefore, I, I, and therefore, the company that took the, the technology, the intellectual property, engineered a new antibody, which is tailored to Alzheimer's disease. Therefore, we can we cannot we can learn very little from patient taking treated with anti PD one or anti PD one uh, to whether they can gain any beneficial. We interview many clinicians that treat cancer patient with anti pd one and based on the regimen, we cannot say anything. Our antibody will be given, um, and right now it's planned to give it, be given every three months and it's a short half-life antibody without ADCC. And to your question, whether there is any connection, there is, but it's it's not established yet. Yes, yet there are seven, at least two papers that I know that show comorbidity. So basically, inflammatory conditions should be correlated with less Alzheimer's, right? Is there? Uh, no, no, no. It's not the same inflammatory condition. It's uh, the inflammatory in the brain is innate inflammatory response. It's a low-grade inflammation. There is no connection. But the dysfunction of adaptive immunity may be common. And you can see among the elderly population, you can see cancer and Alzheimer's. Yeah. So thank. So uh, to the other question, is, is it related more to these two niches that seem to appear uh, a lot in the literature about the meninges as a niche for immune cells and the choroid plexus? So each of them seems to receive different source of cells. Are they communicating between them? How is this interaction? Are they two completely independent niches? Very, very good question. There is emerging data. I cannot tell you for sure what when, that we fully understand it. We are even don't know whether the same T cell are residing in the meninges and the same T cell are residing in the choroid plexus. However, we have the feeling that the function of the T cell at the two niches are different. Based on Yoni work and other people work, the T cell in the meninges seems to activate, affect the neurons in a remote way via the cytokine. The T cell in the choroid plexus seems to affect the, the fate of the choroid plexus itself in terms of being able to serve as a gateway, in terms of controlling uh, inflammatory, the, the inflammatory milieu of the choroid plexus, which impact the brain. I didn't have time to show that the inflammatory milieu of the choroid plexus impact microglia. And this was shown both in aging and in Alzheimer's. Perfect. So then I think it seems that almost everything is there, right? The, we see the infrastructure of all these immune cells there. We see all this, even the connection, the anatomical connection for immune cells from the, from the skull bone marrow to infiltrate the, to kind of gain access to the brain. So what goes wrong? Like, wh why doesn't it work? Well, why we, don't, we still don't have any answer for it? It's a one million question. We still don't know. And now we, we propose that we did macrophages. We demonstrated it. Other people demonstrated in stroke. There was clinical trial with stroke. And if they, based on the data that is that was reported several times over since 2018, that there are micro channels that communicate between the brain and the skull, it seems um, it's very unlikely to understand. We cannot understand. That's the simple answer. Why not more macrophages are entering the brain upon need? And there was a recent paper by Yoni and by others showing that the, the CSF flush the bone marrow of the skull. So the bone marrow of the skull get the sense what's going on in the brain. Why not more? 
we don't understand it. So maybe kind of to wrap up, and we have some questions that if you will be able to answer them in, uh, afterwards to the audience. Uh, I think in the spirit of what we are talking here, eventually it's you can enter this vicious cycle of things not going right in several ways, in several entry points. Either it can be either changes in the inflammatory response in the body or something goes wrong in the level of the brain and the communication between them will change. What is your view of that? Like, how do you think this eventually, is there a presentation? The vicious the cycle? Yeah, I, I guess that in, at least with respect to neurodegenerative diseases, the primary cause is not, in my view, the dysfunction of the immune system. The primary cause in inside the brain, but then you enter very a fast into vicious cycle because the pathology in the brain impact the, the immune system outside the brain and the, impact, the, the dysfunction of the immune system further contribute to disease. But the primary cause, at least for neurodegenerative disease, is not the aging of the immune system, but it started the brain. But it's contributing to the rate of the, the, the uh, speed of progression and the onset of progression. But it's not a causal factor. Thank you very much.